so great to see all of you and i'm just really feeling very inspired we have um a few questions coming in i i would i was really struck subhanallah by um uh what a number of of you um reference which is the idea of of our god-given capacities so dr wild for example um, spoke about our capacity for compassion. Um, it is there, but it's it's a capacity. And we've also seen that, uh, unfortunately, in some cases, it seems people have not maybe uh, developed that, had the chance to develop that. Um, Namarak, you were talking about the holistic approach you know the approach to the community that includes all of all of ourselves um dr noor uh you mentioned how it seemed that some people almost seemed to make a kind of um felt they had to make a choice between spiritual health and physical health you know as if by preserving one uh it would negatively uh impact the other uh, what really strikes me and has struck me over the past number of months is that when we when we look at what what we're losing, that very often it is, uh, you know, the people who are focusing so much on, on what is being lost very often are speaking from a position of relative privilege. Um, and that there are many others who will say, you know what, I've gained something here because before I didn't have access to the community, I didn't have access to the masjid or no one really paid attention to the issue of, you know, mental health in the community and, and connected it with spirituality. But now we have, you know, we have everyone thinking about about the connection between mental health and spirituality because people who otherwise might have never given it a second thought now are seeing the impacts on themselves or or, or others in the community. So um, I'm just wondering if I can get some reflections from you about this issue of uh, of human capacities, integrated capacities, and um, going forward how do we have to think differently and and act differently so maybe i'll begin um dr wild would you like to begin so i you know, I, I um i really like the expression capacity uh because i think it captures um you know it's more neutral in potential um, and it expresses the idea that it needs to be nurtured, grown, tapped, and so on. You know, I think about, you know, the Quranic um, conceptualization of, of um, covetousness and, and possessiveness, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, al -anfus -shuh, that we, we have a capacity in the other direction as well, you know, and unless we are actively and um, consciously trying to grow that positive capacity, then it will grow in the other direction. And um, I really, I'm, um, I'm, I'm awestruck by the Ahmed sisters, I have to say, um, for two reasons, you know, one is, I mean, their, you know, what they did was was actually demonstrate that you can just jump in and do something that is positive, even when other people feel like there's not a whole lot that can be done. But then the stories that they collected uh, are also um, sort of um, um, pulling in the same direction. And so I guess that's the lesson as, I, as I'm re reflecting on, on what I heard from, from the Marig and Arij you know, as community leaders, as people who are engaged in the business of the community, uh, reflecting on this issue of capacity, how do we grow that? Um, how do we make that more the norm than, than the opposite um, response? Thank you, Dr. Wael. Uh, Dr. Noor. Uh, 
I mean, I do think that uh, it's been important to reflect on, you know, the opportunities that the pandemic has given us. And you're right, it, you know, for those of us in privilege, it has felt like there might not have been any opportunities. But as a mom, you know, I've had to um, discuss this often with my children, my oldest being almost 12 and him, you know, talking about how depressing COVID has been, how he hasn't been able to see his friends, he hasn't been able to go to school, he hasn't been able to participate uh, in his basketball team. And then on the other hand, my 10 year old daughter, uh, the other day, uh, they were listening to this, the Lego theme song that goes, everything is awesome. That's the song, it goes, everything is awesome. So, and then my, my six year old saying, even COVID, even COVID is awesome. And then my 10 year old says, yeah, because we've gotten more chance to be together as a family. So just reflecting on, you know, the positives and and just even seeing this Ramadan, you know, we were all so depressed in the beginning thinking there was going to be no tarawih or knowing there's going to be no tarawih, no communal iftars. Um, but then a lot of women I've spoken to have felt like this was one of the most beautiful Ramadans they've ever experienced because of the virtual masajid and the virtual uh, community gatherings that maybe especially moms of small children may have not been able to participate in prior to COVID. So I do think, um, you know, alhamdulillah, our, our religion tries to encourage us to see things in a positive light and to see the good uh, in things, you know, just like the hadith says that anything that happens to a believer is always good. So I think reflecting on, on the positive, you know, has been really helpful uh, especially uh, for me and, and with my children. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, um, Namarak and, and Arij, um, having you dealing with, uh, with different groups in the community who have experienced marginalization, um, you know, just because people who have previously been in privileged positions might now be tasting some of that, it doesn't necessarily mean that that they're making that empathy gap and they're really making the jump from empathy to um, strange, changing the structures <laughs> that that created those the gaps in access um, and potential previously. So, what do you have to say? Um, what are you maybe afraid of, or what are you hopeful of in terms of making those those links between um, communities that are experiencing marginalization, that are being marginalized, and the greater community? Um, <laughs> that's that's a. Uh... Subhanallah, that's something that I, I struggle with myself. Um, I, I feel like, subhanAllah, it's so hard to exercise empathy or compassion when you are not, um, when you don't really know what's happening on the other side. I think there's a, there's a hadith, and please correct me, um, uh, Dr. Wa'il or, or Dr. Noor, um, where Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, um, you know, put your hand on the orphan's head like if you if there's no if there if you're lacking empathy or just put your hand like put your put your and, and I, what i understand from the hadith is put yourself in that person's um shoes I, what i fear and i love that you asked that um uh, and dr ingrid just what's your fear my fear is pity uh, my fear is being looked and sometimes when there's a, such a fine line between compassion empathy and just pity and making somebody feel like I'm giving you because I'm in this position of, of privilege that I can give. And and I'll, I'll share a story about that. And sometimes pity or, or giving could be so well-meaning, but the intention behind it and the positionality of that can change how it's being received. Because let me tell you, it's it's hard to give and to have that kind of heart, but it's just as hard to receive. It's not easy to be on the other end. I Like it is really not easy to be on the other end. Um, but a story is, you know, somebody contacted me and said, hey, I, I cooked some food and I'd like to give it to some people in, in this inner city community. 
And I, I thought, okay, um, you know, this person was was at a position where they, you know, they they were uh, really uh, they were well off. And I said, you know, the, the community knows how to cook for themselves. They have a kitchen, alhamdulillah, that's functional. And the food that you're offering is is not the kind of food that they're used to eating. So being able to, st- and she really was kind of like, oh wow, I'm so so. I didn't even think about that. I just thought I love this food. I'm like, yeah, that's beautiful. But you have to think about the other person. So my fear really is pity. And how do you exercise compassion, empathy in a way where you're not putting yourself first? And I'm going to go back to like the, the, the hadith that we all quote and all, alhamdulillah, all faiths have a hadith of uh, close to this nature where the Prophet Muhammad says, uh, no one truly believes until they love for them, for their brother, what they love for themselves. Um, uh, and sometimes that means you have to step outside of loving yourself a little bit <laughs> and, and step into loving uh, the other person. But Arij, I don't know if you wanted to add to that and if I've covered it well. Um, sure. So one thing that I could add to that is I find that it's very important that you have to take care of yourself first. Um, be strong enough to feel that, okay, um, I'm okay. What, what else can I offer? Um, and then when we're out there offering to people that we're not just going in there and imposing, oh, listen, I know you need this. Oh, listen, just tell me your problems. I know you have an issue. But really sort of... Um, being there and letting them tell you what they want. One of the things that I love that I um, kept noticing in social media is, uh, or they're sending messages saying, you know, if anybody needs uh, grocery shopping that needs to be done, um, or just tell me and I promise I won't, you don't even need to see my face, I'll just put it in front of your door and I'll leave. So it's like another way of, because they just don't know who needs help. So they're just putting it out there, just just tell me who, who needs me. So I find that people are being creative in ways to help each other. And, and that's what I find so beautiful is we're trying to find different ways to um, show that, you know, I do care. Yeah. SubhanAllah. I, um, I was really struck by, Namarak, by your, your story about the woman who, who talked of, about her wound and and of course, we all know that the not only the physician's motto, but the first the first ethic um, in, in any ethical system, including Islamic ethics, is first do no harm. I mean, this is part of our uh, our theological ethics as Muslims is that it's better to avoid a harm than to do a good. You know, many of us just rush in thinking we're doing good, but in fact cause harm in that situation because we don't understand the dynamic or even something more basic, we don't have a relationship with that person. You know, if you don't have a relationship with people, how are you like, on what basis are you running in believing that you, you can be helpful? So um, one of the things that we've experienced is that some, you know, we've had to stop doing some things because of this pandemic and shutdown. What are the things, is there anything that you're glad that we had to stop doing? And you hope that if we're gonna restart it, we at least restart it in a different way or in a beneficial way. If anyone would like to jump in. The pressure to socialize in Ramadan would be the one thing that I'm grateful for. Oh. A little antisocial to start with, but it's always struck me as being, uh, you know, I, I got that from my parents. Um, they had a rule of not going out for iftar in Ramadan. Ramadan was for, you know, family and for taraweeh and qiyam and, um, you go over and you don't go to Taraweeh, which was a common sort of thing. So um, in a small way, I guess that's one of the things I'm grateful for. All right, thank you. No, Dr. Noor? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm not alone in saying that I think a lot of us have really appreciated the slower pace of life uh, during COVID. So although I know my children aren't happy being at home, uh, being schooled at home, but just uh, that slower pace where we're not, 
everybody's rushing at 8, 8.30, yalla, everybody get up, come on, breakfast, come on, come on, come on, come on, everyone get in the car. You know, so now it's like they have a shorter uh, day of school. They are like nine to two, which is five hours. And sometimes it's, you know, really, of course, I appreciate the quiet when I come home from work before they come home from school, you know, pr prior to COVID. But I'm also really appreciating just having them at home around and not having that fast paced life where everyone, everything's a rush and everything has to start at a certain time. And, and it's just, I've really appreciated this, the slowing down of, of life. Arinj? Yeah, I wanted to add uh, what I appreciated was um, when I was a patient, uh, when I had when I was a patient and I had to deliver my baby, I realized oh, everything was just so calm. There was no visitors. It was just me and my loved one. And that was it. Um, and then I realized um, after I had the baby and then being home, um, usually it'd be like everybody would come in and I'm not ready for visitors and I can't say, you know, don't come. So I realized it was just text message of, or, or, or just um, phone calls. And I appreciated that. Okay. I get my space of just, you know, healing on my own and be, and when I'm ready to, you know, um, go out there or to tell them I'm ready uh, for visitors. And I realized it, it gives you sort of room to just um, really appreciate the quietness and only invite people where you need to, because before then it's just, they'll just come in again, thinking of, okay, no, I need to be there for them, but are they ready for visitors yet? Um, yeah, so that was very different, very peaceful, surprisingly. Nimara, what about you? Uh, I would definitely have to echo um, uh, what everyone is saying just around the quiet piece uh, and, and Dr. Noor around the kids. I, you know, uh, so being a single mom of two wonderful children, I, I thought I knew them, but, you know, I got to really know them. I'm like, oh, is that who you are? <laughs> is that how you think? Oh my God. <laughs> so it's been amazing. We both really got to know one another. And I, I, I'm just, I'm so grateful, so grateful for that. And the kids, you know, subhanAllah, they're actually, they loved it too. They're like, this has been the best time, uh, mama. Like I, we're really, we're happy we're playing all these games. Like we got to dust off all the board games from our, <laughs> from our bookshelf and, and play some of them. And it's just been such a, alhamdulillah, uh, I, I do hope this can continue. It just reminded me of home, of coming back home and actually being present, all present, um, because before I don't think I was so present, but I, I have to be the time, alhamdulillah. All right, thank you. You know, before anyone thinks we're just a group of antisocial introverts here, uh, <laughs> what, what, I, what I notice with this is that, is, that, is that what we're talking about is deepening relationships rather than just, you know, being busy. Or, or filling our time because we could be surrounded by so many people and we can be using that sometimes just, just to actually avoid um, working on our relationships. You know, if uh, we have that in our family, we have it in our communities, it, it takes effort, it takes time to be patient and listen and work on our relationships. But if we're just surrounded by people, we never really have to get there. And, and of course, uh, it, it's interesting thinking about those Ramadan dinners. Uh, I've always, uh, I, I too am someone who has tended to, to try to stay away from them primarily so that what I do like to do is to go when there's a community dinner that really includes the whole community. Because I think about the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam peace be upon him, who said that the, the worst wedding is the one where the poor are left out. And so often, you know, our community gatherings, and we're all missing our friends and our community members, but so often those gatherings are, are really uh, structured according to this current social economic uh, structure in which we live where we're segregated by, by income, by professional status, cultural group. And, and we think we're, we're living in a community, but we're living in some, you know, the gate may not be there, but it's still somehow some kind of gated community. So, so I, I do hope that we think about 
uh, about relationships and deepening and and amplifying our relationships so that we really um, you know do understand who is living in our community and not just um, entertaining ourselves and letting our kids entertain themselves with with others just just like them. Um, because I know so many people who are feeling are, are missing those social gatherings now, but I also know that every Ramadan, I, I talk to my students about all of the people who will, ne will not be invited to an iftar, you know, who will never get an invitation and will be breaking their fast alone because no one considers them part of, of their community. So I do hope that's something that we all um, pay more attention to and and me especially first and foremost. So uh, I believe this is the end of our uh, of the, our session. I want to just express my deep gratitude to all of you, um, Noor, Wa'al, Ariyaj, Namarak, my brothers and sisters, who are doing so much for our communities in so many ways. I'm really honored that you joined us today for this conference. And I hope that those who are listening and watching this have also benefited. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to bless all of you and your families and to protect all of you and give you all of the resources you need to, um, you know, to increase the, the good work that you're doing for the sake of God in our communities. And we look forward to the next panel, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.